Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Uh, I do want to thank Harry at uh, Harry's Garage Vids for all his help and his inspiration in getting me going with these. It was his Espada engine rebuild that started all this and the charting of it. Uh, and um, it's funny, the comments that people leave, uh, there's been a lot of comments about one car in the workshop, a very unlikely one. Um, you know, I'm surrounded by uh, Exotica from various countries here. Um, and people have asked quite a bit about the Citroen CX GTI Turbo, this car. It is a rare beast and it is an interesting car, so I'm going to do a video about it. The CX was inspired by various Citroens that went before it. Uh, the DS, the sort of, um, the, the goddess as it was called, the, uh, the big luxury saloon that was used by French presidents and uh, people all over the globe really. And it's still a very chic and cool car today and the SM, the Special Maserati, as it was called. Maserati was owned by Citroën in the late 60s and early 70s, and uh, consequently Citroën wanted a, a flagship model for their, sort of to give a halo effect to their model range, and um, they wanted to give Maserati something to do. So they came up with the engine for the SM, and then Citroën put all their hydraulics in it. And one of the features of this car is the very complicated hydraulic system on it. And I'm going to go into a little bit of um, information about how that works. But the body was, um, the reason it was called the CX is because uh, in French, the drag coefficient of a car, which is called CD, it's referred to as CD in Britain, is CX in French. And this car, when it was introduced in 1974, I think, had a, a drag coefficient of 0.36, which is very slippery for a car of the 70s. Audi came up with the 100 in uh, round about 1982, I think, and that was CD.3, which was incredibly slippery at the time. And Audi made a big thing about it. They even put stickers in the windows saying it has a, uh, a drag coefficient of 0.3. But the CX was Citroen's flagship model. It replaced the SM was a 2 plus 2, it was very cramped inside, the SM. Um, hardly any, the back seats, to call them a plus 2 is a bit of an insult really, but um, it was a big car, uh, as I say, a Maserati V6 engine, and um, it had the, the hydraulic system which um, was taken from the DS and developed, and the CX almost took the hydraulic system completely from the SM, lock, stock and barrel, over. And the CX was quite a commercial success for Citroën, but the problem was it was dogged with politics of um, French car manufacturers in the 1970s. There were so many other agendas going on. There was infighting between Citroën and Peugeot and their rivals, Renault. The engine in this car has been basically one engine or two engines right the way throughout its model life. One was called the Duvrin engine, a 2.2 litre, which we'll put to one side, but the other engine was inherited also from the DS. It's a great big two and a half litre four-cylinder engine, and this engine is as strong as an ox. Uh, if I tell you that I'm very pally with an engine reconditioner who still does a lot of my uh, engine, my machining work, etc., and in the decades he was in business, he never had a Citroen DS engine in for rebuild or a CX petrol engine. Can you believe that? He rebuilt thousands of engines. So this is a really, really, um, it's, it's I think from the 1950s it was originally developed. It's a pushrod four-cylinder engine as it's called. And uh, it's almost unburstable. And as was the fashion in the 1980s, manufacturers wanted cheap high performance. So. Um, as I say, for political reasons, they had no choice but to stick with this engine. They experimented with a flat six. Um, it was originally, one of the original concepts was to put a, a Vankel rotary engine in it. That didn't happen because they were still very unreliable in the 70s. Um, and uh, there was also talk of the V6 that was produced around that time. Um, but no, they, they had to stick with the four cylinder for cost reasons. So what did they do? They bolted a turbo on it like everybody else did. And this was the result. This is an incredibly rare car. I haven't really focused on it because, as I say, we've got, in my mind, more interesting cars here, but people have wanted me to talk about it, so that's why we're here. In turbocharged form, it developed 166 brake horsepower, which doesn't sound a lot, but it wasn't super heavy, the car. It went quite well. Then the Series 2, which this isn't, had the big plastic bumpers, and that had an intercooler on it, which pushed the power up a bit more. 
The engine on these is very tunable, actually. Because it's so strong, you can get horsepower out of it fairly easily, more horsepower, really. And I have adjusted the turbo boost on this uh, just a little bit, and it has increased its power to just slightly north of 200 brake horsepower, based on previous uh, sort of cars that I've worked on, CXs over the years. So the power to weight ratio is, is pretty good, really. And it has a, two or three party tricks, this car, uh, which I'm going to show you and talk about as we go. So let's have a look. One of the, the things that these cars are famous for is the hydropneumatic suspension. Um, so they use a, a mineral-based oil. It's bright green in appearance. And the advantage of it is it doesn't absorb water. So uh, what can happen with conventional brake fluid, DOT4 as it's called, um, is it can gradually absorb moisture out of the air and it lowers, because water boils at 100 degrees C, uh, it lowers the, um, the boiling point of the brake fluid to the point where it can actually boil and many a result, has, uh, an accident has happened as a result of that. But um, also it's a really good lubricant as well, so it helps keep all the pistons and seals and the braking and the suspension free. Um, so I'm just going to start it up now and let's, let's see its first, if I lower the car onto its lowest setting with this lever on the centre console, down we go. And this suspension was, um, was quite revolutionary at the time, the DS had it in the 1950s and I'll put it now, put it up onto maximum height uh, and it was, you can hear the hydraulic pumps and, and um, valves working in the background. The reason, one of the reasons why Citroen did this is it helped if somebody lived on a farm or down a lane or something, it helped with um, ground clearance. You could actually raise the car to get over humps and bumps and things like that because it's quite a low car. And the other advantage is, I mean, it gave an extremely smooth ride as well. But the, uh, the other advantage is if you had a flat tire you just put the suspension on high, put the jack underneath, then put the suspension on low, change the wheel, put it back on high, pull the jack out, and you don't have to start messing about with pumping cars up and things like that. It's really, really clever. Um, so one, one other of the party tricks on this car, the steering system is called a very power steering system. That's what Citroen called it. It was introduced on the SM in, in its form in this. And the steering wheel, the steering column behind uh, the dashboard here is actually a great big hydraulic unit with lots of valves and things on it. And it's got a cam so that the steering self-centers, which pushes down on the steering column as it revolves. So with the hydraulic pressure, I can turn the steering wheel like that. And it always returns to the center position, even if I'm not touching it. Um, it doesn't do the front tyres a lot of good with all that weight on them from the engine and everything, but it's quite, it's quite useful because on the road, if the steering's set up properly, the car tracks dead straight, absolutely dead straight. So I'll, I'll just go into a little bit more detail about the suspension now. Well, what makes all this happen? What's the, the heart of this system, really? It's a, a pump, tiny pump, that's driven by the engine a swash plate pump as it's called with seven tiny pistons inside it and it's driven by a fan belt from the engine can you believe it but um, it does have redundant systems built in so if you break down you don't suddenly lose your brakes but eventually you would and your suspension but um, it, it worked okay so it's not fantastically pure engineering but um, it did work uh, but otherwise this system is sort of a work of genius the, uh, the pump pressurises uh, the, what's called the redundant system. So the whole of the car is pre-pressurised to um, between uh, 180 and 200 bar, so around about 2,200 to 2,600 pounds per square inch. A lot of pressure just from that little pump. And when you press the brake pedal, what you're doing is actually just releasing some of that pressure to the calipers on the wheels. So the pressure's always there, um, and it turns into kinetic energy when you press the brake pedal. Um, the, these spheres here are what control the suspension itself, apart from the, the ride height, the actual way the car rides and the legendary Citroen sort of magic carpet ride 
is controlled by these, and these are so clever. Um, I've got one here, and this is uh, the suspension sphere, and it's uh, got a diaphragm in here. This end is pressurized with nitrogen to 75 bar, 1000 psi, so the, uh, the diaphragm is obviously pushed right up against this end of the sphere, and as this pump pumps the car up, the suspension up, fluid comes into the sphere and actually um, pushes down on a piston and it raises the car to whatever height or lowers it again. But the really clever thing about this is the car's got no shock absorbers because it doesn't need them. Inside here is a tiny hole drilled to a precise diameter and that's the shock absorber for the whole corner of the car. Because what happens is it acts as a restriction for the fluid passing in and out of the sphere as it goes over a bump. The fluid transfers from down here into the sphere and back. And that, the size of that venturi, the size of that hole, dictates how stiff the suspension is. So the smaller the hole, the less fluid can travel through, the stiffer it, the ride is. Bigger the hole, smoother the ride. So simple. Um, and Citroen used this system for years. And because the car had height adjustable suspension, it was actually outlawed in the US in 1974, which is why Citroen couldn't export it to the US. Um, but this makes the system what it is, it's so clever. Another byproduct of that is on the, uh, the estate version of this car, the Safari as it's called, which had a its legendary load capacity, a very, very big um, load carrying capability. The pressure on the back brakes was actually altered by the pressure on the suspension. So the whole thing compensated for itself to stop the back wheels skidding and locking up. I mean, just so clever. And one of the other aspects of this is that I mentioned earlier about the Vary power steering system. To my knowledge, these are the only cars where the steering wheel isn't connected to the front wheels directly. You move the steering wheel, you're triggering a hydraulic sensor in the steering column, which moves hydraulics on the steering rack remotely through a pipe. So while you're driving this, you're not actually technically connected to the front wheels. Um, there is a redundant system, as it's called, so if the hydraulics do go again, there's a very basic steering column, goes from the, uh, the steering wheel to the rack, but it's normally not used. The whole thing is done remote. It's, it's a remote control steering system. So we're gonna take the car on the road now and give it a run, and uh, we'll see another of its little party tricks. Another of the, uh, the great aspects of this car is the, is the smooth ride. It is, it is sort of like riding on a magic carpet a little bit. The, the GTI Turbo versions, such as this one, they did firm up the ride a bit, and they also put thicker anti-roll bars on, which also affect the ride, but it's still very smooth. You sort of glide along the road. Um, it's effortless, really. Um, the suspension system Citroen first used it on the Traction Avant in 1954, I think, just before the DS came out. The, front, the, the Traction Avant was the, the revolutionary front-wheel drive car that sort of set the template for uh, a lot of modern cars, uh, front-wheel drive and front-engined. Um, but the uh, Rolls-Royce um, used the system on the Silver Shadow that came out in 1965-66, and they actually had to pay Citroen royalties for using uh, the concept of the, the high pressure pump uh, braking and suspension system, although theirs were driven from pumps off the engine, off the camshaft actually, in the engine, not via fan belt as the Citroen ones were. Um, and Mercedes used a virtual carbon copy of this system on the 450 SEL 6.9 in 1975-76 and Mercedes didn't pay royalties to Citroen. Um, and the system is almost identical, but I can't imagine there's many car manufacturers that Mercedes imitate or pinch ideas from, but they certainly did on this occasion. And one thing I'm going to show you now is the other party trick. When you accelerate in this car, um, because of the design of the suspension, it almost feels like a jet plane taking off, the back sinks, and um, you get this sort of washing feeling, because like all 80s cars, the turbo, there's lag. There we go, whoop, there she goes. And um, if I take my foot off, 
the whole thing just um, comes back up again. It's like a really weird aircraft taking off sensation. And these cars are deceptively quick. Uh, they really are. Um, they, they were quite a credible car in their day. Probably the closest rival they had was the, the Rover ST1 Vitesse, which was itself a very underrated car. Um, and a similar story to this, really, with the Rover company politics. British Leyland was going through terrible troubles in the late 70s. And the SD1 was a great car, but it never really got its day. So I'm going to just try that again. We'll turn around and just try the back suspension dipping under acceleration. It's a really great feeling. A little bit unusual. It's often interesting to know where the, the history of brand logos come from, uh, and car manufacturers are no exception. Uh, the, the Citroen logo is, is called the double chevron. The reason why it was called this, these are um, gears off uh, a Lamborghini Mura that we got in for restoration, but Andre Citroen um, actually bought the world patent for double chevron gears. And uh, he started off as a precision engineer, as a gear manufacturer. And the double chevron gears, uh, double helix gears, spur gears, um, sort of lined up like that side by side. And that's why we have the logo. That was what he was first known for and what he was initially made his career out of, really. So, yeah, just an interesting facet of Citroen history. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. If you do like it, please like, please share, please subscribe, and we'll see you again soon with something a little bit different again. Goodbye.